Hello and welcome to our third episode of Practice Pearls Podcast, an educational podcast about menopause for clinicians in primary care and OBGYN. I'm Amanda Clark, urogynecologist and menopause physician. And I'm Kim Vesco, an obstetrician gynecologist. And I'm Tovi Anderson, a family medicine physician. Today we want to talk about the practical aspects of prescribing hormone therapy, giving you a sort of how-to guide. A bit of history is helpful in understanding the options that are available. Mandy, I recall you telling me this great story about the history of estrogen. Who would think that it would include a Nobel laureate, a Model T, and prohibition? Yes, it's a very interesting story. So it begins in 1929 when two doctors, Dr. Edgar Allen and Edward Doisy, collaborated to isolate the first estrogen ever from the urine of pregnant women. Dr. Doisy went on to earn the Nobel Prize, but for discovering vitamin K, not for estrogen. As with many famous individuals, they didn't do this work alone. They tasked their wives and graduate students to drive to prenatal clinics all over St. Louis, Missouri, in a Model T, to collect gallons of urine from willing pregnant women. Now, in that era, Model Ts had an open trunk, and there were big jugs of yellow liquid visible in the trunk, One day, a policeman saw those jugs and stopped the graduate student, convinced that he'd caught a bootlegger during the era of prohibition. After providing a whiff from an open jug, the grad student was quickly exonerated. That's disgusting. I would love to have seen the look on the police officer's face. Needless to say, a search began to find a more convenient source of estrogen, which led to estrogen derived from pregnant mare's urine instead of pregnant women's urine. The name Premarin was derived from this source, P-R-E from pregnant, M-A-R from mares, and I-N from urine. Premarin was approved for use first in 1942. Although Premarin was first approved over 65 years ago, a generic equivalent has never been produced. Premarin is a mixture of 10 estrogens that naturally occur in horses as sulfate conjugates, which lead to the common name of conjugated equine estrogens. Conjugated estrogens are absorbed in the GI tract and are bioavailable as an oral tablet. Since conjugated estrogens were the first available drug, most of the early studies using estrogen, including the Women's Health Initiative, used conjugated estrogen. Estradiol, which is the primary estrogen produced by women of reproductive age, wasn't available in an oral form until 1975. The typical starting dose of conjugated equine estrogens is 0.625 milligram. That dose is equivalent to one milligram of estradiol. You may be most familiar with this as estrace. I've prescribed both estradiol and conjugated equine estrogens. I'm curious what factors you take into consideration when choosing a hormone therapy regimen for your patients. Let's consider my patient we discussed in episode one. She is a 52-year-old woman whose last menstrual period occurred eight months ago. She is having severe and bothersome hot flashes and night sweats. Otherwise, she is in good health. Her weight and blood pressure are normal. After we discussed the risks and benefits of hormone therapy, she decided that she'd like to start hormone therapy to help her hot flashes and sleep. I've reviewed the contraindications to hormone therapy. She hasn't had abnormal vaginal bleeding, and there's no history of breast or endometrial cancer. Her blood pressure is normal, and there's no history of coronary disease or venous thrombosis. And to be complete, she doesn't have porphyria. So let's start by listing several factors we should consider when making a choice for your patient. First, your patient has not had a hysterectomy, so she'll need both estrogen and a progestogen to protect the uterine lining. Let's talk about why she needs both. Estrogen causes the lining of the uterus, that is the endometrium, to grow. In a normal menstrual cycle, growth of the endometrium is occurring after menses and before ovulation. In medical terms, we call that endometrial proliferation, and if you biopsy the endometrium in the first part of a woman's menstrual cycle, the biopsy result would read proliferative endometrium. In a normal menstrual cycle, the progesterone level increases after ovulation, and that causes the growth of the endometrium to stabilize, and it then transitions to what we call the secretory phase. And an endometrial biopsy at that time will show secretory endometrium. In the normal menstrual cycle, when the progesterone levels begin to fall at the end of the cycle, the endometrial lining is shed as the patient's menses. Without progesterone to oppose the proliferative effects of estrogen on the endometrium and stabilize its growth, 
the endometrium will continue to grow and it will become fragile. The result is irregular or abnormal bleeding, which you may see, for example, in patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome or in women with abnormal perimenopausal bleeding who aren't having regular ovulatory cycles. And another concern about endometrial overgrowth and destabilization is the development of endometrial hyperplasia and cancer. This is an important topic that we'll discuss along with the evaluation of abnormal uterine bleeding in a later podcast. So just to summarize, estrogen is great for helping with hot flashes, but if given alone, it will cause overgrowth of the endometrium, which could cause abnormal bleeding and potentially endometrial cancer. So we have to choose both an estrogen and a progestogen for patients who have not had a hysterectomy. For my patients, I usually prescribe medroxyprogesterone, acetate, or micronized progesterone. Micronized progesterone and medroxyprogesterone acetate. Well, that's a mouthful. Let's abbreviate that to MPA. They are the most commonly used products. MPA is also known by its brand name Provera and was the first progestogen that was available as an oral agent. It was introduced in 1959, and like conjugated estrogens, it became the most widely used and most studied drug because it was the only option for so many years. And as I recall, the WHI used MPA as the progestin component of hormone therapy along with conjugated equine estrogens. Which reminds me, Mandy, sometimes you say progestin and sometimes progestogen. Are they the same? They are slightly different. A progestin is a synthetic analog of progesterone that has similar biologic activity. You're probably familiar with these as oral contraceptives contain progestins. The term progestogen includes progesterone along with all the progestins. Another term that used to confuse me was micronized, and I admit I had to look this up. Micronization is a way to reduce the particle size of a substance to enhance its solubility and make it more bioavailable. Before micronization, both estradiol and progesterone couldn't be absorbed in the gut and could only be given by injection. Micronized progesterone, which you may also know as prometrium, is associated with a more favorable lipid profile, and limited observational studies suggest that the risk of breast cancer may be lower with micronized progesterone. But we don't have any randomized trial that really elucidates the differences between the progestogens. I have also read that most micronized progesterone capsules use peanut oil as the carrier base, so we can't prescribe these for women with a peanut allergy. Another important thing to consider in your treatment decision for your patient is how to give the progestogen with the estrogen. There are two options, continuous progestogen therapy or sequential therapy. In the combined continuous regimen, the estrogen and the progestogen are both taken by the patient every day. In the sequential regimen, the estrogen is given daily, but the progestogen is given for 12 to 14 days per month. When using a sequential regimen, the dose needs to be higher than it is for the daily regimen in order to provide adequate endometrial protection. We'll talk about more specifics of dosing a bit later. As to the choice between continuous versus sequential therapy for it from an endometrial protection standpoint, Studies either show no difference in the risk of endometrial cancer between these two regimens or a lower risk with continuous therapy. There was a recent large retrospective study conducted using a patient registry in Finland, and that study found continuous therapy for three or more years was associated with a reduced risk of endometrial cancer compared to a sequential regimen. In that study, monthly sequential therapy was associated with an increased risk of endometrial cancer, and sequential therapy using a three-month schedule was associated with an even higher risk. One downside of these data is that they're retrospective, and we don't know about the patient's risk factors or whether they were compliant with the hormone therapy regimens they were prescribed. A downside of the continuous regimen is that it may cause light breakthrough bleeding, particularly in the first six months of use. After six months, most women have no further bleeding when they're on the continuous regimen. A few women, however, will prefer the predictable bleeding that occurs with the sequential approach, and I find this most useful in a woman who still is having occasional menses. Whichever approach you choose, the most essential thing is that the dose and duration of the progestogen therapy is sufficient to prevent endometrial cancer. It is important to stick to the dose and duration of tested regimens. For continuous therapy with MPA, we use 2.5 milligrams daily, 
and for micronized progesterone, 100 milligrams daily. For the sequential regimens, the dose is higher, 5 milligrams for MPA, 12 to 14 days each month, and for micronized progesterone, 200 milligrams for 12 to 14 days per month. Patients often worry me with changes that they make themselves to their hormone regimen. I have had patients tell me that they cut their pills in half or take their hormones every other day in order to save money or to try to wean themselves off of hormones. And while their hot flashes may still be controlled at a half dose of estrogen, the endometrial protection is not sufficient with a half dose of the progestogen. Another thing I've seen is women shortening the length of the therapy on the sequential regimen. For example, taking the progestogen for only seven days instead of 12 to 14. That will still result in a withdrawal bleed, but the endometrial protection is inadequate. I have a lot of patients who have difficulty taking their progestogen because of side effects, like sleepiness, bloating, increased appetite, and feeling depressed. These side effects are sometimes as bothersome as the hot flashes. I've had patients report those symptoms to me as well. Well, here are some strategies that I use to try to manage these side effects. For the sleepiness, I recommend taking the progestogen at bedtime when the sleepiness can be a benefit. Sometimes changing to a different progestogen can help. Besides MPA and micronized progesterone, there are other progestogens. These are the ones you more commonly see in birth control pills. These progestogens are only available in combination pills for hormone therapy, and they tend to be more expensive. What about a progestin-containing IUD? There is a low level of systemic absorption with the IUD, but it may be low enough to avoid symptoms. I think that's a great question. Although a progestin-containing IUD is not FDA-approved to be used as the progestin component of hormone therapy, there is good evidence to show its effectiveness for endometrial protection. I also want to mention a very unique alternative that avoids a progestogen altogether, a CIRM, that is a selective estrogen receptor modulator named basidoxaphene. As a reminder about CIRMs, tamoxifen and raloxifene are two CIRMs that you're likely to be familiar with. CIRMs have both agonist and antagonist activity with the estrogen receptor that vary in the various tissues, and thus can target estrogen activity in specific tissues. Basidoxaphene opposes estrogen action in the endometrium and thus provides protection. Basidoxaphene only comes in a pill in combination with conjugated equine estrogen. Its trade name is Duo-V, and it isn't yet available as a generic, so cost of this medication may be a limiting factor for patients. It's nice to know there are so many options for our patients. What are your thoughts about prescribing hormone therapy in pill form versus a patch? The choice for oral versus transdermal therapy depends on a number of factors. For health considerations, transdermal estrogen avoids the first pass effect through the gut and liver and therefore has less of an effect on lipids and coagulation factors. There are some observational data that suggest transdermal therapy is associated with a lower risk of venothromboembolism and stroke compared to oral therapy. Because of these reasons, transdermal estrogen may be the preferred option for women with metabolic syndrome diabetes, obesity, and for older women who choose to stay on hormone therapy. Another consideration is whether your patient needs both estrogen and a progestogen or if she only needs estrogen. Estrogen is available alone in both oral and transdermal form. Progestogens, however, are only available alone in oral form. In the transdermal form, they come combined with estrogen, and there is no patch for progestogens alone. Transdermal estrogen is most often provided in a patch that is changed once a week, like Clomera, or twice per week, like Vivelle. The once-weekly patch is larger in size than the twice-weekly patch, but some women don't like the idea of a patch altogether. Uh, Some women are as sensitive to the adhesive in the patch, and others find that sweating causes the patch to fall off. I have to say, sometimes the most influential factor for patients besides personal preference is cost. And for us as providers, our choices are influenced by what is covered by the patient's insurance. Yes, and considering cost, oral estradiol and conjugated estrogens are the most affordable options. The various estrogens are similarly effective for relief of symptoms at bioequivalent doses. As we mentioned earlier, for example, conjugated equine estrogen at 0.625 milligrams a day is the same as estradiol at one milligram a day. 
The various progestogens differ from each other more than the various estrogen formulations. MPA, or medroxyprogesterone acetate, tends to be less expensive, and we have a lot of data about MPA from the earlier studies in the WHI. Both estrogen and progestogen pills are available as generic options, and these may be less expensive for our patients. I can't imagine there would be many patients who'd want to use a weekly patch for estrogen, but take a pill daily for the progestogen. However, this could be a cost-effective option based on the patient's insurance plan. There are a few other less commonly prescribed options to consider that we haven't discussed yet. For women who want or need transdermal estrogen, but they can't use a patch, there are both an estrogen gel and an estrogen spray that can be applied daily to the skin. And there's a unique adverse effect that may come with these forms. The spray and gel may allow unintended estrogen exposure to individuals that have close physical contact with the user within two hours of application. This can be an issue for children, pets, and intimate partners. Additionally, there's a vaginal estradiol ring that is designed to treat hot flashes named the fem ring. The fem ring is not to be confused with the est ring, which is a vaginal ring designed to treat vulvovaginal atrophy. These two rings differ by the dose of estradiol that is provided. While the fem ring is quite effective, I've rarely had women who choose this treatment approach. What about bioidentical hormones? Many of my patients ask for bioidentical hormones. From their internet research, they think bioidenticals are more natural and safer. I think it's an important distinction to make that what patients think of as bioidentical and what we as medical professionals think of as bioidentical are different. We think of 17-beta estradiol and progesterone, the hormones that the ovaries produce during the reproductive years. Bioidentical hormones are drug formulations of these two hormones, estradiol and progesterone, but ones that are synthesized from plant substrates. Some bioidentical hormones are compounded, which means that the therapy is prepared in a pharmacy and not by a pharmaceutical company. Compounded hormones are not subject to FDA oversight and the quality controls that regulate pharmaceutical companies. So one downside is that we don't know if the dosages provided in these products are accurate. Further, the black box warning isn't required on compounded products, which supports the notion that compounded hormones are safer. A common misconception that women often have is that compounded and bioidentical mean the same thing, which of course is incorrect. Another common myth is that bioidentical hormones aren't available as a prescription. We've already talked about estradiol and micronized progesterone, and they are indeed bioidentical by the medical definition. Additionally, there's a new formulation of estradiol and progesterone that has been combined into a single capsule named Bijuva. This medication has received FDA approval to actually be marketed as bioidentical. An added plus is that the new formulation does not contain peanut oil. Unfortunately, the word bioidentical has also become a marketing term used to promote these compounded products as safer options. But the idea that compounded bioidentical hormones are safer is also a myth. In fact, it's the opposite. Compounded hormone products may be less safe because of uncertain quality and dosing, particularly with regard to endometrial protection. One example is progesterone cream. Many women like to use progesterone cream, but it is not well absorbed by the skin. And as we said earlier, the dose and duration of progestogen exposure is vital to providing adequate protection against endometrial cancer. Another myth is that women can undergo testing of their saliva to help adjust their hormone levels, which gives the impression that the dosages of these products can be tailored to meet the exact requirements of each individual woman. That myth is particularly problematic for me. First, salivary testing is inaccurate. There's no relation to serum hormone levels. And a single measurement, even if it were accurate, is still problematic as hormone levels are quite variable in the perimenopausal phase. A one-time test doesn't convey the whole story. Earlier we were discussing cost issues. Salivary testing and compounded hormones are not covered by insurance companies and Medicare, which adds a financial insult, especially if the test is not meaningful. The problem with compounded bioidentical hormones is not small. It's estimated that 1 to 2.5 million U.S. women use these compounded preparations. 
So as clinicians, knowing how to debunk the misinformation around hormone therapy is a big part of our counseling for menopausal women. Taking everything we talked about today into consideration for the case scenario we discussed of my healthy 52-year-old patient who is having few periods and horrible hot flashes, I think I would prescribe either oral estradiol, 1 mg daily, with micronized progesterone, 100 mg daily, or a combined estrogen progestin patch. However, one thing I'd like to bring up is that I sometimes get phone calls from women after I've prescribed hormone therapy who have purchased the medications and then read the black box warning on the package insert and wonder why I've prescribed such a dangerous medication for them. I get those calls too, or I find out at the next visit that she read the package insert and then threw away the prescription she just purchased. The FDA requires this warning for the package insert for all estrogen preparations. That black box warning is derived from information from the first WHI report in 2002, and it warns women about an increased risk of breast cancer, heart disease, dementia, stroke, and venous thromboembolism. And it doesn't report the benefits of estrogen that were known in 2002, nor has it been updated to reflect studies that confirm the timing hypothesis. When women ask me questions about the black box warning, I review our discussion about risks and benefits. But this conversation also suggests that the woman is interested in reading more about hormone therapy, and then I point her to several excellent resources for patient materials provided by NAMS and other professional societies. We have covered a lot in this episode. Here are some of the key messages that I'd like our listeners to take away. There are multiple options for hormone therapy to accommodate a variety of patient needs and preferences. One of the most important considerations is that women with a uterus be prescribed an adequate dose and duration of progestogen therapy to protect the endometrium. And it is important for women not to try to adjust or taper the dose or frequency of their progestogen on their own. Another thing to consider in making a choice of hormone therapy is the cost and convenience for the patient. There are both oral and transdermal options. Transdermal therapy appears to have less effect on lipids and coagulation factors and may have a slightly lower risk of venous thromboembolism and stroke compared to oral therapy. Another consideration is continuous versus sequential progestogen therapy, and I have a preference toward continuous therapy, as most women prefer the amenorrhea that results on this regimen, and there are some data to suggest that it may provide better endometrial protection. There are so many other interesting things to discuss, and one thing we haven't yet touched on is non-hormonal therapy options for menopausal symptoms or how to address abnormal uterine bleeding, particularly in women who've begun hormone therapy. We haven't talked about the genitourinary syndrome of menopause and local vaginal estrogen therapy. It's a good thing we have three more podcasts. Stay tuned for our next episode. This is Amanda Clark. And Kim Vesco. And Toby Anderson. Thank you for listening to Practice Pearl's podcast, Menopause. All cases appearing in this work were developed to highlight common clinical scenarios. Any resemblance to real persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental.